So for confidence intervals, I provided my students with a take two, where I backed up and took another run at the topic, trying to explain my way through the problem, trying to provide kind of a and more of an intuitive approach to it. So I did the same thing with hypothesis testing. And let's go ahead and try this out on you and see if you um, find it more intuitive to um, the previous treatment on hypothesis testing and also maybe other resources for it. So let's put together a really practical example here and then we'll work through it conceptually and see if it helps. The problem. In space you have a data set. Now there's a population underlying this within this space or this region there is an underlying population which you could have sampled exhaustively we never have the money to do that we never have access to the subsurface in order to do that and so effectively effectively we don't have the population we have a sample set with a limited number of observations that are available to us so you have sampled the subsurface or any spatial phenomenon and when you calculate the distributions from this region here and the distribution from this region here and you plot them and you label them as sample 1 and sample 2, you plot them and you see that the distributions in fact don't overlap very well. They look very different from each other. And so you say, ah, aha, I have two separate populations. Maybe there's two different things going on here. In fact, maybe I should draw a line right here and just say that there is something dramatically different at that point within the subsurface. That would be very important to know. To know if, geologically speaking, the world changed at this line right here, and we expect that now we have different rock, different things going on. We have to have a different strategy in how we're going to work with that. We might expect um, new things to happen. We might be able to draw conclusions separately for here to here. This is powerful information. We want to know if these two data sets are, could be from the same population. They look different, but, but it's just a small sample. So we don't really know. We want to, but we want to check to see if they could come from the same population. We want to know if the population might look like this. We might in fact have like the black line where underlying all of this is really two separate modes or populated things are distinctly different or maybe it really looks like the red line and just due to sparsity few samples it's looking like these two peaks and if only we sampled more it would smooth out and we would in fact see that it is all this same nice distribution the problem we have is the fact that there is structure in random so we can be fooled right we could have a set of samples that all happen to be high and a set of samples that all happen to be low. The fundamental problem is this, small numbers. And we're protecting ourselves from a very important bias, a very negative bias, and that is the cognitive bias of the belief in the law of small numbers. So Tursky and Kahneman, they actually have a really important publication on this back from 1971. I wish the world would know this publication because it would help with so many different issues we have with people assuming this, that samples randomly drawn from a population should be highly representative, even if it's a very small number of samples. In other words, if I have a population that has an average of 10% and I drill four wells, the average of those four wells should be 10%. The variance should be equal to the variance of the original of the population. The P13 should be the same. And we just know that that does not happen. It, you could have four wells that are all very high. That can happen randomly. If we understood this issue around small numbers, we would understand. And so what are we doing with hypothesis testing? We're protecting ourselves from this bias right here. We're recognizing the fact that things can happen randomly and we want to test to see if what we observe could have been random effect. So what are we going to do? How would we be able to perform a test? How would we be able to assess whether or not this could have, these two samples could have different means or different variances or whatever it might be just by random effect? Well, we have to put together a hypothesis test. 
And so the first thing you've got to decide is what are you going to compare? If you want to compare due to two distributions, you've got to choose what it is specifically. It makes sense to compare the mean, maybe the variance, or in some cases, we actually compare the entire PDF or the entire histogram just by using the comparison of the frequencies like with a chi-square test. We're not going to do that today, but that would be one way to do it. So let's pick something to compare. We'll set up a hypothesis. Our scientific hypothesis, our statistical hypothesis, is that the underlying population parameter responsible for data set number one is equal to the underlying population parameter of responsible for sample data set number two. Therefore, they could have come from the same population from in as much as they have the same mean. So it could have been the same population. Of course, you could also test the variances and so forth. You could test more. So that's the test that we want. So we got sample one, its distribution, its mean. Sample two, its distribution, its mean. Let's get a hypothesis together. So our hypothesis test, our null hypothesis is that the population responsible for sample set one and two, that they have the same mean. The, no, the alternative hypothesis would be that they're not equal. And so we got to decide on a metric, and a very simple metric to work with would be subtracting the one sample mean from the other. How different are they? That's, that's a good indicator. If they were very close to each other, it makes sense that in this type of a test, we'd be much more likely to say they're probably the same. And so that's a good metric. Now, the next thing we need to know is what is the sampling distribution if we were to take a bunch of samples of those sizes from a phenomenon with specific statistical behaviors, distributions, means, and so forth, what would we expect would be the resulting distribution of the metric? If we did it many times, if we had many cases where we took N1 samples, the number of samples in sample set 1, N2 samples, number of samples set there with their specific sum summary statistics. If we were to go ahead and do that many times and calculate the mean every time of 1 and 2, sample set 1 and 2, and we subtracted that and calculate the distribution of that, how should it be distributed? And so the question is, what's the difference of two Gaussian random variables with a small sample size, an unknown standard deviation, what should it be distributed? And it turns out from statistical theory, we know it should have a student's t distribution. Of course, as the number of samples goes very large, practically it becomes a Gaussian distribution, but we think it should be student t distributed. And so that's, that's super helpful. We now know how this thing is going to be distributed. So we're able to go ahead and plan. We know a metric. We know how the metric should be distributed. And so let's go ahead and formulate our hypothesis test. Oh, this window is moving around. Okay. All right. So we're, we know it's going to be student t distributed. This is our metric. But so we have a difference and we have a distribution. The distribution we'll use will be a standard distribution, um, mean of zero, standard deviation of one. It doesn't have cooked into it how much spread it has. We, we need to go ahead and calculate the amount of spread. Where do we get that from? Standard error tells us how much spread there should be in a statistic due to random and due to, due to the fact that we've random effect, we have a small sample size, we don't want to have belief in small numbers, and due to the variability observed within the sample set itself. So the standard error for this metric mean of 1 minus mean 2 is equal to this somewhat complicated but if you look at it it actually has some logic cooked into it first of all the standard error in the mean was the standard the square root of the variance the sample variance divided by n if you look at this equation you kind of see that happening the numerator has this variance of 1 and 2 but they're being added together with a weighting a weighting based on how many samples they each have and then you'll notice that it also has a division of the number of data. Now, this part here is part of the weighting, ensuring that we are basically putting a certain amount of proportion of weight on one variance versus the other. And this component right here is accounting for the fact that we want to count for the number of available data. Okay, so 
just intuitively, it looks similar, but it's a little more complicated because the fact we have two different sample sets and so forth, but it is a standard error. So it tells us how much spread. We got the metric, we got the statistic, we know how much spread. We're basically ready to go. We can go ahead and take the metric, divide it by the standard error, and we get a statistic, a T statistic. Once we have a T statistic, I apologize, this case here I'm showing Z, but in our case, if we had enough data, we could use the Gaussian distribution. But it would be the same thing if a student T distribution, certain degrees of freedom. Once we have the T statistic calculated by taking the metric and dividing by standard error, we can go ahead and look up that T statistic directly from this distribution, from the standard student T distribution. So we put it on the, we put it on the distribution and we check whether or not its value, the t-statistic, exists within the critical values for that distribution. So we got to look that up. The critical value from a student t-distribution, well, difference in means, 95% confidence interval. We're going to expect 2.5% on this tail, 2.5% on that tail. We're going to have a certain number of degrees of freedom for the test. We can look that up. It's just simply going to be n1 plus n2 minus 2. You can, in fact, see that right there. The degrees of freedom are shown right there in that equation. And so we can go ahead and look up the critical value in T, check to see if we're within, um, check that against the T statistic and see if the T statistic is within that T critical value. If it is within, we fail to reject. If it's on the tail, we reject the null hypothesis and we accept the alternative hypothesis, accepting to live with the fact that we have an alpha, which is 5% chance of a type 1 error, falsely rejecting the null hypothesis. But that's life. You have to live with some error. Okay, so that was another attempt to go at explaining hypothesis testing. I hope that helped. One remaining topic would be the p-value. When we run a test in R and Python, it's very convenient. They give you a p-value. Remember, when you've got, you've got the t-critical, You've got the T statistic that you got from the test. You can then take that and put that into the distribution and do the forward of the distribution and calculate the associated cumulative probability value. In this case, we're at the P40. So when it reports back 40%, it's just indicating to, indicating to us exactly where on that CDF you were. If you're between the 2.5 percentile or 97.5 percentile, then you would fail to reject, otherwise you reject. Now some methodologies such as the library SciPy stats reports the p-value two times that value. What is it doing? So what it's doing is let's say your actual t-statistic turns out to be your p40 value. Well, what would that indicate? It would be, you might be interested to know at what alpha level would you in fact reject a P40? Well, you would need to have 40% on the tail here in order to have an imminent rejection, to be right on the threshold of rejecting a P40 outcome for your T statistic on your distribution. But if you have 40% here, it's a two-tailed test, you'd have to have 40% here. Your alpha level, in fact, would be 80% for you to reject if your T statistic came back as the P40. And so that's why the report, the report in the alpha level at which you would have rejected. Okay, so that's the interpretation of the p-values. That finishes up kind of all the discussions I have about hypothesis tests. I hope this little take two was helpful to you in order to help you understand intuitively what hypothesis testing is all about. I'm always open to questions. I'm happy to discuss any time. You can email me. You can contact me here on YouTube. In addition, if you want to try some of this out, I have, in fact, put on GitHub a demonstration of doing confidence intervals and hypothesis testing in Python. And there's another one for R also. Um, I, I hope that those are helpful to you. All right. Thank you.